going to begin by asking a question. Who's ever gone through something or, or been involved in a situation that led you to ask the question, why? Why me? What's going on here? And sometimes even, yeah, that question, you direct it to God. Why, Lord? I believe in you. I trust in you. Where were you? Why? And these are some honest questions that a lot of us can find ourselves asking at some point in time in our life. And I felt like the Lord wants me to share a message just to shed light on that, to find a place for those questions and to really lead us to hit the right perspective. Because I believe your perspective will either make or break you. And I've titled this message, Make or Break. Amen. We're, we're doing a, a series on the goodness of God. And we've been hearing so many good things about how God is good and He's good all the time. But the reality is there's times when things aren't good. And things can be, you know, pear-shaped as we call it. Um, things that you thought were going to go one way go another way. Things that you were praying for something, believing for something, expecting something, but then you got a whole different result. And then we're left with this tension. Yeah, I've prayed for someone, but they didn't get up. I believed for that job, but I, I got rejected again. And time after time, if we don't choose to place these things in the right yeah, box or category in our lives, then we could very easily just live a life that I would define as broken. Yeah, life will break you if you choose that perspective. But there is a reality in the goodness of God. There's something that we can press into as a person, whether you're a mom, uh, whether you're a dad, whether you're a child, whether you're a single, whether you're in a relationship, whether you're married or not, kids or not. There is a perspective that we can have that is in so it's in tangent with the goodness of God. It's connected to the goodness of God that we can actually go through every situation where we're not broken, we're actually just established. Where our situation, our loss, our whatever doesn't yeah, break us but actually makes us. It grows us deeper in the Lord. Amen? So some of this will be a reminder for some of us who's been along for a long time. I've been around for a long time. But again, if you're new, I'm hoping that I'll say something today and God will say yes to your heart. Amen? Amen. Another question for you. Why do yeah, bad things happen to good people? Has anyone asked this question or been asked this question before? Why do bad things happen to good people? And this mystery is what the world is always asking. Um, if you have people in your family that go through a season or a time of sickness or there's just trouble, whether that be a divorce or that be some kind of conflict, this question can appear and it's something that I believe we need to have an answer to. Why does yeah, bad things happen to the best of people? This guy's a good person. I'm a good person. How can a good God punish or do things to yeah, me, a good person? How can I receive the, the rough end of the stick? These sort of mentalities, these sort of questions are, are real. They're honest. But the answer yeah, we find in the Word of God. So turn your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And this is at the end of one of Jesus' best sermons, the Sermon on the Mount. And he talks about everything under heaven. Anything that you need, any question, you'll find some principle or some answer from Jesus that will actually yeah, give you some direction. So I always encourage you, yeah, these red letters are power as we've talked about before in this church. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27, and we all know this. It says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Everybody say the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Everybody say rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, will be a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Uh oh! And the rain descended, the floods came, and you, you guessed that the winds blew and beat on his house, and it fell, and great was its fall. What's interesting about this parable is that we have a wise man and a foolish man, and I don't know which one you believe you are today. I'm not sure if anyone wants to put your hand up if you're a fool. Won't get too much response. But I get a lot of response for the wise people. But regardless, in this story, the storm comes to who? 
The guy who had his house built on the rock and the guy who had his house built on the sand. It doesn't matter whether you say you're a fool or you're wise or you're a good person or a bad person. Jesus said storms are going to come. Yeah? Following Jesus is not a storm avoidance program. You're not saying, I will follow God and I want everything to be perfect and I want Him to smooth out, iron out my issues, my problems. Nah. Following Jesus still means you live in, the, in this world. And if you're going to live in this world with other people, with people and their own free will and their own decisions and our own yeah, mistakes, you're going to come across some form of a storm. But Jesus gives us hope that even amidst your storm, you can plant yourself on the rock. So when the storm comes, you're what? It doesn't break you, it just makes you even stronger. This guy's house that passes the test, I'm sure his house was a little bit stronger after that storm. His confidence would have been a lot stronger after that storm. If I just got through that, I'm going to get through the next one. And this is what I want to talk about this morning. We need to be a people that are established and have the right perspective, the right way of thinking. That, you know, I know what, that God is good and life sometimes is going to offer me a storm, things are going to happen. But I'm going to choose to, to always promise myself that I'm never going to question the goodness of God. I'm going to choose to place my trust in the living God. And so many times, yeah, although we, can ask, we know this truth, we read this parable, the storm's going to come. But when we're in the storm, we quickly forget this. And then the questions start. You know, who's ever heard of Apostle Paul? Yeah? Cool. He had a pretty rough life. The guy was shipwrecked. He got beaten. He got beaten on his beatings. He got beat, he got beat, he got beat, he got beat. So many, three times he got as many stripes on his back than Jesus got. Yeah, Jesus got 39, he got that times three. This guy copped it everywhere he went. He was hated. If we want to talk about following Jesus and the life that's maybe available to you, if we talk to Apostle Paul, man, he's got a rough life. On paper, no one want his life. None of us here would say, I want his that life. But you know what? He followed Jesus and it didn't mean he was in a storm avoidance program. He had a lot of things coming. However, he talked about the joy of the Lord. He talked about the peace of the Lord more than anybody in the Scriptures in the New Testament. He wrote most of the book in the New Testament. Why? Because although his life, yeah, well, everything wasn't going perfect, but he had his faith established, rooted, anchored in the goodness of God. He knew who God was. And that perspective caused Paul to say stuff like this. It's better to me to lose than to, to gain. To die is to gain. Yeah, he said these things that, you know what, if I'm here, I'm here. If, I, if I'm not here, I'm with the Lord. He had this ability to say, although my outward man, what's going around me is perishing, my inward man is being renewed day by day. He had that perspective that would be made, not broken, when he went through those tough situations. My question this morning is, what kind of perspective do you and I have? When we're going through our stuff, when things are happening, what perspective are we going to have? And I think what's a huge uh, hindrance to even putting our trust in God is, number one, that we just think everything that happens to us is God's doing. Yeah? That's a huge theological matter. Not everything that happens to you is, was sent by God, that was chosen by God. Yeah? There's a whole bunch of different categories, but just three. Yeah? Number one, sometimes God will test us. He wants to challenge us. He wants to stretch you. So yes, some things He says, yes, I want to test you. I want to discipline you. Yeah? And when we look at the Scriptures, your comfort isn't in high regard with God. I'll be honest. God's objective is not to make you happy. His job is to make you holy, but not happy. And when you realize you're holy, your joy will just flow. But His job, He's not sitting on the throne, how can I make Harry Watson happy today? What do I need to do to make him happy? His job is, I have a will and I have a mission. I want to save the world. And our happiness, we'll find it in that. When we get about the kingdom, our happiness, our joy, it's all in that. But let's be honest, God's, yeah, His priority is not to make you happy. His job is to, is to get you on mission and get you thinking about other people. And there will be a joy in that, amen? Come on, it doesn't sound too joyful, this response. There will be a joy when you realize. But I've got to tell you the truth. Your happiness is not, the high, is not His top priority list. However, He is still a good God. We've got to come to terms with this. Number two, sometimes there's an enemy involved. There's some spiritual warfare going on. And yeah, those can be blamed for some of the stuff that's going on. But I think a lot of the time we're too quick to give the devil glory. Say the devil's doing this, the devil's doing that. When it's not even the devil. It's probably just you. It's probably just me making some horrible decisions. 
And now we're giving praise and worship to someone who did nothing for it. So number one, sometimes it's God, sometimes it's the devil or spiritual things. And number three, sometimes it's just me and you, my friend. It's just us running red light cameras. It's us not wearing a jumper when it's late at night. And we get flu, we get fines in the mail. And it's not God punishing you. It's not the devil coming after you. It's just you. Not taking responsibility for your life. Not using the wisdom of the Lord. Okay, I'm not, you don't need to clap for that one. <laughs> but is everyone with me so far? Let's just come to terms. Yeah, let's, let's just make it really simple. Rather than even asking who's, at, who's the one doing this, let's just choose. And when things happen, we choose to just declare the goodness of God. I don't even need to know why this has come. I just need to know what I've got to do. You cannot determine yeah, what comes in your life, but you can choose where you place your trust. And this morning, that's what I'm talking about. We need to all choose where we're going to place our trust. You know, so many Christians, we don't know, and we're not established in the goodness of God. Yeah, we're going through this series, and this is why I felt the Lord saying, make sure you make this very practical, because I don't want people sitting in four weeks of the goodness of God. And they know God's good in theory, but when they're in the storm, they're like, what the heck? And they're on the sand, trying to now move and move their house in the storm and build on the rock. This story does not say that the storm came and the guy picked up his house that was on the sand and tried to now put it on the rock. It's too late, friend. It's too late. The storm has come. You have to know that God is good before the storm. You need to be established on the rock before the storm. You cannot pitch a tent in a storm at night in the dark. Has anyone tried that? Yeah, I've been camping with a bunch of youth kids and we got there in the daylight. We've decided to play games. I don't know what we're thinking. And when sun started to set, we've got 20, 30 kids trying to set up tents. And there's the pole for my tent. It's over there on the wrong tent. And I've got the t phone in my, in my mouth, my torch. And we're just like, you know, let's just sort of sleep in this big sleeping bag sort of thing. Eventually, we got it erected. But my goodness, it was hard work. If you try to find the right perspective, if you try to understand if God is good in the storm, it is going to be very difficult. And you may find it, but you most likely won't. And to too many Christians, we say we know the goodness of God. We declare it with our lips, but our hearts are far away from that truth. And then when things happen, when the storms come, we're trying to now pray, God, I trust you, but I don't really trust you because I didn't trust you when things were good. Is anyone with me? I don't know if I'm talking about you, but I know I've been in this situation before, but I feel the Lord saying, this has got to change. I want my people to be established on the rock. In the good times, in the bad times. So that way, regardless your perspective, you are going to have victory in life. Well, you, could, yeah, you can reign and rule with life. And if we're honest, in the room of this size, right now there's people who are going through things. There's people who are coming out of things. And there's people who will be going into things in this next week. So this message matters. And your perspective is very important. What perspective will you have? What kind of attitude? What will you keep in your heart? Will you be able to still promise and swear that God is good even when your surroundings yeah, don't indicate that? Because you get, you get laid off this week, a diagnosis comes or whatever, what are you going to do? Are you going to freak out or are you already on the rock and you're going to say, you know what, we're going to withstand this storm because I know my God and my God is good. This is so important. Amen? I wrote here, your past... Your pain, your loss, your disappointment will either make you or break you. And how you respond to those things, your perspective to the, to the storms of your life will either determine whether they're going to be a platform that you can share how good God is from or they're going to be a prison to you. Your pain in your past will either be a platform or your prison. It's going to keep you bound and stuck and for years and years you've got this unresolved issue that you never got an answer for you went through something someone died or something happened and you kept it in your heart and you confess that things are good but you're in church today and you're still holding yeah, the wound of something that happened 10 years ago I call that a prison my friend you're in a prison your, part, your pain has become a prison but if you choose to have the right perspective then your pain can actually be a platform that now you can experience a joy, you can experience a peace that now you share to other people. And now your problem, you now step on top of it and you get a little bit higher, you get a little bit stronger, you get a bit closer to the Lord rather than being in prison far away from Him. Are you with me this morning? Alright, cool. Alright, we've laid the foundation. So how do we do this? I've got three steps. Step number one. 
is be real. Turn to someone and say, be real. How can I have this, this perspective that I will be made in the storm, not broken in the storm? The first one is be real. So many times we're not honest with ourselves. We're not honest with other people. We're going through stuff and we have questions, but we think it's that if we just don't address it, we bury our head in the sand and we think the storm is going to pass or things are just going to get better. No, no, no. You need to be real with what's going on in your life. You need to be honest with yourself. You need to take what's going on, take the mistake that you made or that someone's done to you or whatever it is because some horrible things can be done to us sometimes. We've got to take all that and we've got to talk to God about it. We've got to share. And so many times we as believers, we think we just don't want to, we don't, you know, we think our feelings are carnal and whatnot. But if you're feeling things, you need to talk to God about those feelings. Express them to Him. But when it comes to what you're going to declare out of your mouth, we want praise and we want goodness of God to only flow. But if you haven't been honest, you're never going to be able to praise God genuinely. If I haven't been honest with the situation, my hands won't be up in worship because how can I sing that, Jesus, Jesus, you are so good, when I don't think you're good? Because I just got told something this week that has now redefined the goodness of God in my life. We need to be honest. And one story that really sticks out to me is John the Baptist. Matthew 11 Verse 2 to 6, John the Baptist, yeah, he's declared, the previous story says that he has declared that Jesus is the, the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. He has had a revelation of who Jesus is, this man. But now we find some other language coming out of his mouth. Meanwhile, John heard in prison about the works of Christ, and he sent two of his disciples to go ask him, are you the one who was to come, or should we look for someone else? Meaning, are you the lamb of God? Are you the saviour? Or should we look for someone else? Verse 4, Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear. This is the prerequisite for the team of Tim, the evangelist team. The dead are raised, the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is he who does not fall away on account of me. Interesting response by Jesus. Yeah? But John, we want to focus on John's question. John has had a revelation of who Jesus is, just like some of us in this room. We, we confess, we know He's good, we know He's God. But now He finds Himself where? In prison. And He thinks, wait a second, are you the one? How many times do we know God's good, but then when we get in a storm, now we really find out where we're at? He had this, he was the first person to declare that Jesus was yeah, God's Son. He's come to take away the sin of the world. John 1 verse 29, powerful scripture. However, now John, the same guy who said that, is asking, are you really the one? I'm unsure now. And I have to, we have to, I have to think about this. What has changed? His circumstance has changed. What has changed for John? Jesus has remained the same, but what's changed for him? He's now in prison. And he knows Jesus is the one who's come to preach uh, liberty to the captives. He's come to tell people who are in prison, you're freed. And John's been saying, Jesus set you free, Jesus set you free. And now he's not free. And he's like, wait a second. Basically saying, are you Jesus? God, are you good? For us, it's what it looks like. God, I know you're good. And it's easy to say that on this side of the problem, but now I'm in the problem. I'm questioning, are you really good? Can I trust you? When we go through stuff, we start to question what we already know. When we go through that, yeah, that sickness, we really are going to find out if we believe God's good or not. It's easy yeah, on one end to say it, but when we're in the middle, what are we saying in the middle? We need to learn from John. What I love about John is that he's just honest. We can all say, shame on you, John. But at least he asked. And Jesus didn't just leave his question. He said, go and tell him that the blind are seeing, the dead are being raised, and don't let him be offended on account of this. Yeah, don't let him be offended that although I'm preaching liberty to the captives, he's still in prison. That last part is for John. John, you're in prison, and this is just the part that you're going to play. You said you've got to decrease for me to increase. It's time for you to... Put, yeah? Put your money where your mouth is. And that was just how he finished. That's unfortunate for John. But does that make sense? Sometimes we, we know God's good, but then when we're in the moment, yeah, we can question. But we need to be honest to Jesus with our questions. We need to talk to Jesus. Don't talk to people about it. Talk to God about it. If we talk to people about it, we're going to just get their opinion. We need to talk to the good God, our Father, and we will get what we need, just like John did. He got exactly what he needs. And I remember being in a time, we've got two beautiful children now, myself and my beautiful wife, Grace. But before we had Isaiah and before we even just started, um, Grace and I made a covenant 
not a physical one, uh, with our words, a promise that we're not going to make a covenant until we are ready to be married. So we decided, you know what, we're going to abstain from sex and we're just going to hold hands and sing songs while we're dating. We didn't really sing so many songs, we definitely held hands. And then when we got married and we made covenant officially, consummated it before the Lord, there was a good six or seven months before we got pregnant. And I remember month after month, she would ask me and say, Babe, we, we said no to sex. We wanted to honor the Lord. And part of honoring Him, we, I thought we would be pregnant by now. I thought He would have brought this child. Why is it taking so long? Um, you know, and, and then every month, I would, say, I would say the same thing. I don't know, but let's just keep trying. I don't know, but we're getting one month closer. We're getting a month closer to our baby. We're getting a month closer to our baby. But she would ask the question, but if, if we've dedicated, we've, we've committed, we did this for the Lord, why aren't we seeing the return? I said, I don't know, but what I do know is that God is good. And we're not going to get a baby asking these questions. It's not going to make it come any faster. So let's just take these, this question that I don't know the answer to and just say, we're, one, we're month, one month closer to our baby than we were last month. And let's just keep trying. Let's just keep having sex. So we kept doing it. And eventually, we got a child. Yeah? If someone didn't know that's how you get a baby, sorry. Your parents didn't tell you. Too late. You should have been told this. I don't see anyone under 12. You should have known this already. But we've got to be real. Yeah? And I was just real with Grace. And together, I didn't condemn her and say, why are you thinking like this? That was a real reality. I said, you know, it's a good question. I thought it would be, I thought, first time, honored you. Yeah, but it hasn't happened. But that's okay. God's still good. And we just keep moving forward. And we're not going to get stuck. and not going to let this question become some place where I get stuck. I'm just going to keep praising the Lord. Yeah, we've got to be real. And you know what? It's okay to feel something, but it's different to then act on it. The Bible says, be angry, but sin not. For anyone who thinks it's, you're, you're a bad person if you feel stuff, hey, it's normal to feel, but the Bible says, be angry, sin not. Don't act on those feelings. Don't live your life based on your feelings. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. What's that saying? Don't sit and stay in this place. Get this fixed before the next day. Yeah? Feelings are great servants. They help us, but they are horrible masters. They are great servants. They help fuel you, excite you, but your feelings are not meant to be your master. They're meant to just be your servant. This is the difference here. Are you with me? So point number one, how can I have a perspective that, that puts me in a position to always praise God where I am made, not broken in the storm? Is be real. Number two now is trust Him. Somebody say trust Him. When we trust Him, now this is the part where it gets a little bit hard. Okay, I've been honest, I've told God what I want, but now I've really got to place my trust in Him. Philippians 4, this is from Paul. Philippians 4, 6 to 7. This guy is in prison while he's saying this. Keep that note, yeah? He's in prison, he can't do anything. And he says this, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. After we've been real, when we talk to God about how we feel, now we've got to decide, am I going to trust Him or not? Am I going to let the unknown cause me to just doubt, cause me to complain, cause me to just take my hand off the plow, cause me to turn back, cause me to give up? What are you going to do? I want to encourage you that you need to just trust Him. Paul is in prison and he's saying, if you're anxious about anything, this guy's got heaps of stuff to be anxious for. He's established all these churches and he's about to get his head chopped off. And he thinks, what, what's going to happen? What's going to happen with all these new souls? What's going to happen with all the... Maybe you've got things in your life this morning and you're anxious about them. You're, up, you're not sure what to do or you haven't seen an answer yet. The advice is still the same. Don't be anxious about anything Give it to God in praise, in thanksgiving, in all supplication. Does that make sense? We've just got to put our trust in God. And continuing, I guess, a story that, so we couldn't have a baby for ages, told Grace, let's just trust God. We got to this place where we now had, we, she got pregnant. And I think it was only eight weeks in, we lost the baby. And I was praying and praying and praying. And we were seeing the signs. The doctor said on Friday, your baby is dead. There's no heartbeat. And we walked away and said, no, nah, not accepting that. And just kept praying and kept praying and believing and believing. And then we're all the way in Geelong uh, on a holiday. And then she passed the baby and it was, it was all. And then suddenly I did not see what I was believing for. And I remember being in the hospital and there's put us in the little curtain in just a public sort of thing. People everywhere, it's busy. And these questions were reeling through my head. 
you prayed, but nothing happened. You believe in a good God, doesn't look too God right now, does it? What did you do? What did you allow? Is this something that could have stopped? If Jesus was here, would this have happened? And question after question just kept coming and coming and coming. And then I remember just thinking, you know what? I'm going to just like, let go of this situation. And I did sermon in that moment that I am not going to focus on what I don't know. I'm just going to focus on what I do know. And what do I know right now? I said, Grace, what do we know? We know that our baby has been received by the Lord. Right now, God is still on His throne, that Jesus is still King. Although we didn't see what we wanted to see, it doesn't change who God is. Our circumstance doesn't redefine who God is. And life is not going to be our teacher. Experience is not going to now determine the truth in our lives. Jesus is going to determine the truth. So let's just take this, this ugly feeling, the pain. Of course, we've got to mourn and we've got to lay this baby to rest. And we've got to do all that, but we are not going to get imprisoned by this situation. This is going to become a platform. We're going to just praise God in this situation. And from that little situation, I've had multiple, multiple, multiple conversations with women in particular. And when they've told me they're hurt about a miscarriage or a stillborn and then told me that God did it, and I'm not sure why, and they're still upset about it. Years, I was able to help them, multiple women, and say, hey, God didn't do that. He received your child, but he did not take them. That's just part of life. It's part of the fall. And let's not even try to die, pin it on anybody. Let's just pin the praise on God. Let's just pin our trust on Him. And I've seen so many people. So why am I saying this? You get to the point when you're real, but you've got to actually trust in God. Don't just say, God, I'm not sure, and then don't actually resolve the situation. Me and Grace made that decision together. We're not going to focus on what we don't know. We're going to focus on what we do. And when we gave up our right to understand why, 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 why? That's when the peace came. In that little room, in that, that, under that curtain, I got the, the peace of God. The, the peace that Paul says here, you will receive peace of God which surpasses understanding. How do you get peace that surpasses understanding? When you give up your right to understand. We want the peace that surpasses our understanding, but we want to understand first. It doesn't happen. When you say, Lord, I don't need to understand why. I don't need to know what happened. I don't need to know what you're doing. I don't need to know what's all going to happen and how you're going to use this, but I'm just going to praise you. I'm just going to focus on what I do know. I'm going to tell you that you're good or that I don't feel good. Or it doesn't feel good or taste good. I'm just going to praise you. And the moment you do that, now the peace that goes beyond understanding can be accessed by you. Yeah? So often we want the peace but we, we want to hold on to our questions. You've got to now give up. You've got to tr put your trust in Jesus. And I think for a lot of people, we never get past this point. We put God on trial. We ask Him questions. If you were good, this wouldn't happen. Blah, blah, blah. I've got to tell you in love this morning, if you have unresolved issues, you've got to commit them to God. Don't let what's happened now yeah, determine and dictate what truth is. This is the truth. Yeah? This is the truth, not your experience, not my experience. doesn't matter what any of us have experienced. The Bible, the Word of Jesus, the Word of God, that is truth. And we need to all determine where we're going to place our hope. Well, I didn't see a miracle, so God isn't a miracle worker anymore? I'm waiting for a job. I still haven't got a job. Does that mean He's not Jehovah Jireh, provider anymore? He's Jehovah Rapha, my healer, but I haven't been healed yet. Does that mean He's not a healer anymore? No. Don't let your, your question mark redefine who God is. Let who God is answer that question. Yeah? Huge difference here. This is how we have a perspective that will be, yeah, that will be made and not broken in a storm. Number one, we've got to be real. Number two, we've got to trust Him. And I'll finish with this. Number three is that we've got to release praise. It's not just good enough to be, yeah, be real and then trust, but actually let it come out of your mouth. Yeah, which my story has kind of already gone ahead of me, but we had to make the decision in that moment to praise. And when we praise God with, a, with no real reason to, other than His goodness, that moves heaven. That actually gets God now involved in the storm, in the situation. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, an awesome passage of Scripture, but just real quick, it says, Therefore, by Him, by Jesus, let us continually, everybody say continually. That means all the time. Offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. It says that we should always be giving a sacrifice of praise. That means we should always be praising God that costs us something. 
in that moment in the hospital, it, it hurt to say, God, you're good. And although we didn't see this baby come to fruition, you're still good. It hurt. Yeah? But that's now defined as a sacrifice of praise. It's easy to praise God when your vats are overflowing with milk and honey, as we've heard. It's easy to praise God when you're in health. It's easy to praise God when you've got a partner and kids and everything. But when you're single, still waiting for those things to come, what are you saying in those moments? Because that's when you have an opportunity to offer a sacrifice of praise to the Lord. Does that make sense? So many times we praise Him when things are good, but we don't praise Him when things are bad. But when we praise Him when things are bad, we actually invite God into the situation, into that mess, and He can start to work all things together for your good. But unless you praise Him, you can't let Him work it together. When you praise Him, you're inviting Him in. Yeah. The Bible says that God inhabits, He dwells in the praises of His people. So when you praise Him, what that means? You're inviting Him in. You're empowering God when you praise Him. You enthrone Him and empower Him. What happens when you don't praise Him? You dethrone him. You don't invite him. What's an, what's an uninvitation? It's a, I don't know. You uninvite him. You don't let him in. And we're there waiting for God to come and he's like, let me in. Start praising me. Start releasing it out of your mouth. Although you don't feel it. Although you don't see it. Just start saying it. Just start declaring it. And then I can come in. That's how we, this is how this works. The kingdom of God. Yeah, It's this upside down kingdom. When we don't feel good, we've got to declare by faith. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am weak. What's Paul saying? Paul knows this. It's this perspective. I will not be broken by this. I will not be imprisoned by this. This is just going to empower me. This will actually make me. Are you with me? Now, after we've gone through this experience, this was probably within the same month, we got an invitation to some worship night. So same story, me and Grace, after the miscarriage, and we're in a good place. And I heard this quote shared. Um, I went to this worship night, and Brian Johnson was there, and he was sharing about something he went through. And he said this, he goes, my dad said this, and the quote is, I need to take the pain of loss, of confusion, of disappointment, and hold them really close to my heart. And in that context, give God praise. In heaven, I won't have any confusion or pain or loss or disappointment. The only opportunity that I have in all of my existence to give Him an offering that costs me that much is now. Do you know that in heaven, He's going to wipe away every tear from every eye and there will be no sickness or death. So in heaven, the praise, the worship is only going to come from this good place of being in His presence the only place where you can worship God whilst being in pain, whilst being in discomfort, whilst not knowing the answer to the question is right now on earth. The only chance to offer a sacrifice of praise is now. In heaven, you will not be offering a sacrifice of praise. It will just be a natural response. You will be in the goodness of God, talking about the goodness of God. But when you're in a storm, you think, oh, woe is me. Paul says, or James says, take joy when you're in trials. Why? Because you have the opportunity to give God something that you never have the opportunity ever again to give Him. We need to be a people that don't misuse the tough moments, but we actually can take those moments, bring them really close like we did in the hospital and say, Lord, this feels crap. This feels horrible. And I don't even know why, but I'm going to praise you anyway. And in that moment, we are offering a sacrifice of praise that we can never make in heaven. One day when we meet our daughter in heaven, that one that we didn't get to meet, we, we can't worship God. It won't be a sacrifice then, but we can do it now. So often we miss, we, we, we don't even take opportunity of the things that are going on and offer Him a sacrifice of praise because we don't release it from our lips. What do we release? Complaining, more questions, and we're just actually uninviting God. We're pushing Him, shutting doors and not letting Him in to situations that we really need Him to come into. My goodness, imagine if we took every opportunity of loss and said this, as much as this is sad and there's people involved and we've got to be respectful, of course, but I would love if someone heard me. If I was complaining for months, I would love if someone just said, hey, Neil, you really need to deal with that complaining and start praising <laughs> because your situation isn't getting any better. It's happened now. can't change it, but what you can change is your perspective on it. If, if this bad thing happened, you might as well gain something from it, so start praising him. Start being real, start trusting Him, and start releasing praise and watch as God will turn it to good. The upside down kingdom, it will come in and you'll experience the goodness of God. Is this making sense to anybody? Cool, so my question then, to finish, is where's your perspective at? 
When you go through things, what are you doing? How are you navigating yourself through life's problems? Are you staying silent? Are you burying your head in the sand? Are you just utterly confused? Maybe you don't even know Jesus and you're doing this yourself. Let me tell you, Jesus isn't just your ticket to heaven. He didn't die on a cross just to, to give you access to God. He came to bring heaven to invade your earth so that you can experience the peace, the love, the joy in the storm. He didn't come to take away the storm. He came to be your God in the storm right there with you, in your house so that it won't fall. Are you with me? This is the truth. This is who our God is. And I've just put some things here. Maybe this morning, yeah, your, your storm or your place that you find yourself in, you're waiting for something. Maybe you're waiting for that partner. You're waiting for that person. Maybe you're waiting for that job. You're waiting for that answer to prayer. Let me tell you, my friend, start praising Him. To start praising Him. And as you praise Him, God can now finally go to work on bringing you that partner, on bringing you that job, on bringing you that thing that you need. Because in the place of silence and just complacency and complaining, you tie God's hands. He can't do anything. If, if He inhabits the praises of His people, then who inhabits the praises of your complaining? Somebody else that we don't want. If, if, yeah, if our praise invites Him to come in and empowers Him, then who empowers? Who are you empowering with your complaining? So I'm, this isn't an option. I'm not saying, here, think about it. You need to praise God, my friend. You need to praise you need to declare. And what happens as we praise God? What happens? We get, it just changes your, your perspective. Things start to lift. And if I could call it like this, you just seem to get higher than your situation. There's like a separation that takes place. And as I praise Him, I get higher and I get higher and I get higher to where I can get to the place where Paul says we are seated in heavenly places. And now we're looking at our problems, not from yeah, earth, but now from heaven. And now I can praise and I can pray from this place. And what happens when you get higher from something? What's below you becomes smaller. Anyone been in a plane and seen the little people in little cars? Yeah? They're real cars, real sized cars. Took me a while to figure that out. So in planes, you see all the little stuff. No, those little stuff are big stuff. You just got higher. Your altitude changed your perspective. When you praise, your perspective will be changed. And your problems, your problems that were like this big, now become this big. When you praise, God will lift you up, lift you up, lift you up, and now you're in a place where you can actually make the right decision about something. That's how God handles and sees these situations, from His bird's eye view, yeah? From the kingdom of God. So I want to challenge you, do you have yeah, this perspective? And right now, if you know, yeah, I'm believing the Holy Spirit, I pray that He will reveal unresolved situations that perhaps we have in our lives. If there's something that's happened in the past, or that's happening today, or that's going to happen this week. Yeah? If you're listening or if you're here this morning, don't leave that thing unresolved. Is God good? He is good, my friend. And hand, surrender that situation. You didn't see what you wanted to see. You feel like you were disappointed. But I tell you, God is good. He didn't drop the ball, my friend. The answer to the question, He'll give you that answer. But the answer is somewhere down here. Someone down here, whether it was a lack of this or a lack of that, the problem is not up, at, up with God. The problem is down here with us. But trust God. Release the praise out of your lips and He's going to capsize your perspective. And you will not be broken. You will actually be made. If you have these unresolved issues, it's like having your shoelaces undone. And you're going to walk around and if you try to run, it's going to, it's going to stop you from running well. You're eventually going to trip over. If we leave unresolved issues, eventually we're going to stumble and we're going to fall. And one time you might fall, get up, fall, get up, but eventually you'll fall and you won't get up. And that's how people walk away from God. If your heart was like a stone and something bad happens, something that you're not sure why it happens, and that bad situation, if you don't attend to it, if you just leave those whys, they're going to cut into that stone and it's now got a crack. And that crack causes everything else to get brittle and now there's a gap. And if you have your heart isn't set on the goodness of God, life is just going to keep opening this gaping gap and eventually your trust in the Lord is going to be broken. Your trust in God will be no good and then you're just someone who used to believe in Jesus. Who Maybe you're sitting in here and you used to trust God, but I'm saying we can trust God when we have this right perspective. Turn to somebody say, make or break. So just in finishing, because time's gone, we need to be real. We need to yeah, trust Him and we need to release praise. And I really feel the Lord saying, people are going to, right now, I believe this perspective is going to set you free. 
it's going to yeah, clear your head that stop blaming God for something that He didn't do. And if God really did it, then ask Him for the grace yeah, to help you through that thing. But a lot of the times it's not God, it's just us. It's not even the devil, it's just you. And we just need to come to terms with that. But we don't want that responsibility. But I want to tell you, your perspective is mine and your responsibility. Once we get that right, then God can do what, is his, what He's responsible for, which is to bring the breakthrough. But if you don't yeah, take on your part and choose to see the goodness of God, then how, He can't do His part. Yeah, we're in partnership with Him. We co-labor. Yeah? 90% God, 10% us, but we still have to do our 10% to release the goodness of God. And just like the devil talked to God about Job, he said, God, if I can just touch his stuff, if I can touch his life, then he'll curse you. The devil thinks the same thing about you, friend. He thinks if he can cause you some trouble, if he can stir your life, shake your tree, that you're going to curse God. But what about when he comes to shake your tree, you just start to praise God. When he comes to touch your life, and to meddle with this and, and cause your children to go this and, and cause this confusion. What about if when he does that, we just praise God even more? He's going to take his hand off you in, in, in quick time and he's going to run and try to find someone else he can taunt. But what happens if he tried to destroy you and that very thing, he just actually established you with that very same thing? What the devil tried to kill Job with actually made Job even stronger. He got more in the end than he had in the beginning. What's this mean? If we have this perspective, what the devil does to destroy you will actually just make you. But your perspective yeah, is what determines the difference here. This morning, be real, trust him, release praise, and we will see how our perspective releases the goodness of God. Amen? God loves you. He wants to speak to you, and he wants you to really resolve these issues.